Good morning and welcome to the Justice Committee's 14th meeting of 2019. There are apologies from Daniel Johnson. Agenda item one is a decision on taking items five and six in private. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed, thank you. Um, agenda item two is consideration of a negative instrument, international joint investigation teams, international agreements, EU exit Scotland order 2019, SSI, 2019 oblique 149. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has considered and reported on the instrument and had no comments on it. I refer members to paper one, which is a note by the clerk, and um, invite any questions or comments on the instrument from members. If there are no, no comments, um, is the committee agreed that it doesn't wish to make any recommendation in relation to this instrument? We are yes. agreed. Thank you. Agenda item three is a report back from a visit of um, two of our members, uh, Jenny Goruth and uh, my, myself, um, to Kilmarnock Prison. The clerks will provide a detailed report in writing for all members, but we thought it would be good to give the committee a flavour of what took place during the visit and some of the issues that were discussed. Um, I'll start and then ask Jenny if she's any reflection that she wishes to share. Can I start by saying that this was an extremely worthwhile visit and I want to thank Michael Guy, and, um, who's the prison director, and his team for organising it and for the time they spent with us. The opening session covered general background, logistical type information and a short discussion. And um, there then followed um, a tour of the, the prison and the various um, parts of the prison, the visitor centre, the prison reception area, one of the prison wings and the education centre. Uh, and to start um, our tour, our request, then we asked to see how the rapid scan machine worked. It can detect NPS and other drugs which are sent in the mail to prisoners and this has achieved encouraging results, helping to block these Ill illegal substances getting into the prison. And as such, significantly, it helps to reduce not only the harm the, to the prisoners themselves, but also the related incidents of violence um, that prison staff have to face. During the tour and in our discussion thereafter, the effort that was put into looking after the health and well-being of prisoners was evident. This continues at every stage of a prisoner's time there, and importantly, thereafter, trying to prepare them for release to find suitable accommodation and employment. However, once again, the problem of third sector groups having to continually apply every year for funding and the related uncertainty uh, about continuity of service and the ability to maintain, to maintain relationships built up with prisoners was raised. Also raised was the lack of support or education for prisoners on shorter sentences. So whilst resources are scarce and time limited, if someone is on a very short sentence, the clear message given to us was that these prisoners could also benefit from support. Finally, we saw ourselves, for ourselves how important the visitor centre was in maintaining family contact. And the Breakfast Club initiative was particularly impressive in helping to maintain a natural relationship at weekends with prisoners and their children. Jenny, do you have anything else that you'd like to, to add? Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, just a few kind of reflections. Um, one of the things I certainly took from it was the, the programmes around about education, which we spoke about. Um, I was quite taken with the fact that we have an idea of where prisoners' educational needs are, but actually they don't all have to be assessed for the literacy needs and they can opt out of that, and more than half do, which tells us something about what's going on, perhaps with their own experiences of the education system. They just don't want to engage, and I thought that was quite telling. Um, the second thing I picked up on was around about housing, and the housing needs of prisoners when they leave prison and how that's tracked or monitored. Um, I think there was a bit of you know, confusion there with different people finding different uh, alternatives. And so that pathway from when they leave prison, it'd be interesting to get a, 
a better maybe national picture on what's going on or whether or not that's localised just to the Kilmarnock area, I, I don't honestly know. Um, the third thing they mentioned was how many people are going to prison now. So that jail that we visited in Kilmarnock was built in 1999, so it's 20 years old. So as they said at the time, it was a prison very much built for its day. It's also a private prison. But I was quite taken with the fact that, you know, pretty much all the staff told us we're still sending too many people to prison and it doesn't work. Um, and yet their livelihoods depend upon the prison working. So I thought that was an interesting point to take away from it. Um, so, you know, certainly going in and thinking about that and, you know, the government's policies around presumption against uh, short-term sentences and how does that filter out in reality within our prisons um, and sentences that are passed down, people being on remand or short-term sentences, they don't necessarily need to be in jail and what are the alternatives that are being considered. Um, and third, well, lastly, I guess the family unit, which we looked at on the way out, which I was really impressed with, how they help support families uh, in Kilmarnock and prisoners in general um, and try and break down barriers. But, you know, it's still at the end of the day, a prison which is covered with barbed wire. So you're not ever going to get away from that. So it's quite an interesting approach to how you engage families in that situation. Yeah. As I say, we find it really worthwhile and there were so many issues raised that we'll go into detail when the clerks do the report, but do other members have any comments on, on what you've heard so far? Yes. Yeah. Uh, just on the point that you made there, Jenny, about the housing, um, did you get any sense, because I find that very interesting, because I've heard that at several prisons I've visited, the, the, the prisoner comes out and then there's a housing issue and unless and until that's addressed you can end up in a in a, a, a downward spiral very quickly. So did you get any sense from your discussions about on whom the responsibility lies for ensuring that the prisoner uh, comes out and is housed because one would have thought that isn't the prison's responsibility directly. <laughs> no, I, the prison. I don't think it is the prison's responsibility. I think there was a lot of discussion around about third uh, sector organisations providing help, but that you know, coverage being um, patchy in some places and perhaps being disjointed. I think there was also confusion around benefits reforms and how that's impacted upon what prisoners might be entitled to when they leave prison. So um, it's a, I guess it's, it's quite a confusing landscape. And if you've just come out of prison, where do you go? Where's your first port of call? Um, no, I don't think there was clarity necessarily on who that responsibility fell on per se, but maybe the convener got more from that. What they did say was they tried to make sure that no one left uh, uh, the prison on their own and, and left to yeah. their own devices, that someone would try to be with them, and sure they did have co uh, accommodation, but if there's sickness, if there's various things, you know, people will slip through the net, and they know that time when they leave the prison, they go through these prison gates, is absolutely crucial. So I suppose that that was reinforcing some of the, um, the stuff about resources and third sectors, mm -hmm. having that three-year planning or a longer plan the one year in term to try and make sure that that would always be in place. Yes, just to be clear. Give me a run, because I know you're looking to come in. Um, so it's the third sector that's really looking after that space. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and, and that's the bit and that people needs working, to be got right then. You know, with the prison team within the, the prison, the officials, but, you know, their, their remit ends um, when the, the people leave prison and then the third sector can continue the through care in whichever form that is. And I'm not necessarily sure how to that is nationally of what's going on because we were only in Kilmarnock prison, so I, you know, I think it would be important to have a look at other uh, you know, ways of dealing with it. It's yeah. maybe not necessarily the case in Perth, for example. I don't know what their situation yeah. is. Well, there. for example, the Rapiscan is only in Kilmarnock prison and it's the only one in Scotland <coughs> that has it. So it doesn't mean that what we yeah, saw in right. Kilmarnock is repeated in the the other um, prisons. Rona. I think it is a pretty general issue on the cross-party uh, group uh, for women's justice. It's an issue that we are tackling, well, not tackling, it's on our agenda. And we have a speaker, and the name just escapes me, she's from a housing association coming to a future meeting, and they deal almost specifically with trying to rehouse women coming out of prison who, you know, uh, don't have any um, specific place to go. So it, it, is, it is a problem, and I think the more we highlight it and make people aware of it, um, you know, it will get better. But, I mean, I can, I can report back after my 
meeting when that, that person comes helpful. along just to, to clarify. Uh, and the clerks can also approach the SPS yeah. um, for a kind of national yeah. picture. But John um, will probably remember Alison McInnes, you know, trying to get into legislation this uh, necessity to have accommodation as a prerequisite of somebody leaving prison. John. Yep. Thank you, Kevin, and thank to you and Jenny for your feedback on that. I, I think the third sector do play a very valuable role in supporting yeah. prisoners, but it shouldn't obviate the obligation, the statutory obligation, which is placed on the local authority regarding housing. Yeah. And I know that, for instance, they were involved both, I think, Highland and Murray in, in Inverness Prison. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, Jenny's point about the benefits to there and having a fixed address to get it, it, it has become a, a more involved net um, uh, riddle to try and solve people coming out, all the complications about having uh, a fixed residence. And there's a lot of good work going on, um, clearly, but it's might appear fragmented, but it's, uh, mm -hmm. there's a lot That's of good, good work going on in many areas. It would areas. be quite good to look back at Alison's amendment, because I'm fairly sure that was passed. It might be in legislation. So by the time the clerk's report, very detailed report of what was discussed comes forward, we'll, we'll have that information. Fulton. Yeah, yeah thanks, Camino, and um, thanks also to you, uh, Jenny, for the, for the feedback. Um, I, I think it's actually symptomatic of the presumption, um, you, you know, not, not the presumption, the, the, the use of short-term sentences just now that the stuff has happens and my own experience when I when I worked in uh, criminal justice was that um we all, the, the kind of talk was that if if a prisoner was on some sort of order, perhaps a community payback order that was running concurrently with a with a short term prison sentence, they were actually in a better position because they there was statutory um support for them. Whereas if somebody's released from prison, I think what what you're talking about there um, there, there, there is no support in place. There might be an offer of voluntary support, but the person may choose to accept it when they first get out, but then um, their, their, their lifestyle and, and, and behaviour patterns can kick in again. They also might, um, they, they, they might meet with, uh, with relatives at the, at, at the door, but then there might be relationship difficulties there and stuff like that. So it can be a vicious cycle for folk. And I think it's, I think it's another reason why we shouldn't have short-term sentences. Um, certainly, then, the release from prison is a critical time, and that was made absolutely clear to us. So, um, as I say, a very worthwhile visit, and we'll look forward to the, the clerk's report. Agenda item four is feedback from the recent meeting of the Justice Subcommittee on Policing. Following the verbal report, there will be an opportunity for brief comments or questions, and I refer members to paper two, which is a note by the clerk. And invite John to provide that feedback. Um, thank you, Convener. Um, as you say, the, the committee has a feedback note at, uh, at the paper two there. Um, um, the subcommittee met on the 9th of May and we took evidence from Police Scotland and the Scottish Police Authority on their responses to the subcommittee's report on the proposal to introduce cyber kiosks for use by frontline officers. Police Scotland informed the subcommittee that they are satisfied they have the legal basis to introduce the use of cyber kiosks based on advice from Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service and a legal opinion that they had sought from Murdo MacLeod QC. However, they also agreed that legal clarity would be welcome. The SPA board is to consider a paper on cyber chaos and the legal opinion at its meeting on the 22nd of May. The external reference group and stakeholder group are to consider the draft data protection impact assessments and equality and human right impact assessment, along with other documents on the 11th of June. Following these meetings, it's Police Scotland's intention to um, deploy cyber chaos in late summer. The next meeting of the subcommittee will be on Thursday, uh, 30th of May, when it will take evidence uh, on the Scottish Government's capital funding provisions to Police Scotland. And the subcommittee will hear from witnesses representing police officers and staff. Um, and we'll return to the issue of cyber chaos when we take evidence from the Cabinet Secretary for Justice in our final meeting before summer recess on 13th June. And that session will focus on the Scottish Government's response to the subcommittee's report on the cyber chaos. And I'm very happy to take any questions. Anyone okay. Thank you, Convener. Lee MacArthur. I think, um, as, as John said, it was a, I think a very useful um, session. Uh, I, I think we've, we, we struggled to cover the ground, even in an extended session, and obviously we've followed up both with Police Scotland and the SPA with a number of questions, particularly around the, the legal advice that, that, that um, uh, John referred to. And, and while I think we have come a long way um, in, in, in pushing Police Scotland uh, to a, a better place on this, there, there remain questions uh, that uh, I think require answers. I think it was telling that both Police Scotland and um, the chair of the SPA, um, when pre pressed, acknowledged that much of the legal framework here 
um, is uh, of an analogue um, age and, and trying to keep pace with the, um, with the development of the technology and, and the pressures on the police uh, to combat cybercrime and indeed other crime that has a kind of cyber element to it, I think was uh, very well made and, and I, I, I think both seem to be encouraging of a review of the, the, of the, the legislation in this area to try and find a kind of a framework that is more fit for purpose in terms of the, 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 the balance that needs to be struck between, as I say, the, uh, the, the, the combating crime on the one hand, but the, uh, uh, the, the human rights and, and other rights that are caught up in this and that have very much been a part of the, the Justice Commit Subcommittee's uh, uh, deliberations. But I, I certainly find it a very useful session and, and, and I think the, the session with the Cabinet Secretary will, will uh, only extend that. Thanks. I think there's been substantial progress since we first mm. looked at this issue and we're in a much better uh, place now to cope with what's a, a never moving and changing set of circumstances that the law has to keep up with. Yeah, just, just to add that, I think um, they both uh, seem very um, uh, pleased with the work that the subcommittee had done on it and felt it was really helpful and constructive to them. And um, they seem very um, happy to be cooperating with the subcommittee. Okay, any other comments? Well, that being the case, agenda item five is the discussion of um, a letter in private um, from um, well, correspondence that we're dealing with from the Finance Committee. So we now move into private session. <laughs>